Today we're in Isaiah 6, and thank you, Peyton, for reading that. If you'll have your Bibles open there, this is, I, I would think, a pretty familiar text to us. Now, we've heard this text before. I, I know we probably heard 1 through 8. We might not have heard the rest of the chapter as much. But um, I want to focus on the relationship of a holy God to a holy people. And we have to know what holy means. There's a story that of a Jewish man who went to, uh, he, he went to his rabbi and he said, I've traveled all over Israel. I've gone to um, Masada. I've gone to the Western Wall. I've gone uh, to Jerusalem. I've been to these places and I can't find holiness anywhere. And the rabbi said, um, are you a bafustic? And the man said, what? And he said, are you a bafustic? And he said, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what that means. And he said, well, just answer yes or no. And he said, I can't answer if I don't know what, what it means. And he says, well, uh, neither do you understand what holiness means. You have to define something before you start saying you're going to look for it or not find it. And so what does holiness mean? God, it's, it's rooted in God. God in His character is, is holy. And holiness comes down to us to mean, and I'd, I'd say probably if I asked you, it would be something like a moral quality, that we act in the right way, we're holy. But originally, it has to do with, with it's, it's rooted in God, and it is, He is the other. He's separated. He's, the, uh, he's completely different, the other. And so the fact of a moral quality comes from the fact that we want to be like him. Notice here the, the famous thing when Isaiah hears about these angelic beings in verse 3, uh, and they're crying out, holy, holy, holy. Then look at the last verse of the chapter, Isaiah 6. After, after Isaiah's told, here's your message, and it's not too encouraging, it's going to be a message of judgment. Then the last verse, verse 13, he says, there will be a remnant. There will be, and notice how it's described, a holy seed. So God is holy, and there will be a holy seed. There will be a holy remnant. Now, one thing that's strange, and I don't have the answer to this, is this is the call of Isaiah, and yet it's six chapters in. We've already seen five chapters. Is, is he preaching unauthorized there? Is that he hadn't been called or what? Uh, well, it's difficult to know the time of all this. Uh, it appears chapters 1 through 5 is uh, later on in his uh, prophetic career. But chapter 6 is, is his call. Why do we have it here? Why don't we have it? It seems like this should be the very first chapter. He's called, he sees God high and lifted up, and God says, here's your commission. Why don't you have it here in chapter 6? Well, I don't know, but I do know chapters 1 through 5, messages of judgment, and here Isaiah says, I'm commissioned by a holy God to preach this. So I don't have the final answer why we have the call here in chapter 6, not in chapter 1. Another thing, and this may... Uh, uh, I, I don't have to tell you, but uh, our, our, our nation is in uh, what w w we could describe as political unrest. There's, there's division in our nation. And I'm not getting into one side or the other, but I'm recognizing that there's political unrest. There's division. Four years ago, we could say our nation was in political unrest. Isaiah, at this time when he sees the Lord on his throne, it's a dangerous time. It's a time of political unrest. What happened? Well, this king, he says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the king. Now, it's a very dangerous time when the king dies. And he, he reigned for 52 years. Think of that, and as I was thinking about that and restudying that, I thought that's just that's just amazing. I mean, fifty-two years, a ruler's on the throne, and now he's died. Now the rabbis say this is not his physical death because Uzziah was generally a very good king, but he um, at, toward the later part of his life and his reign, he he took upon himself and to offer sacrifices. 
And the priest said, you don't have that authority. And he does that. And when he does that, God strikes him with skin disease. And the rabbis say, that's the death. So it's not a physical death. Well, I think it's probably his physical death. So he died in the year that King Uzziah died. Isaiah says, I saw the Lord. The point of this is the king might have died. The ruler is gone. But the real ruler is on the throne. And when we think about our time of political unrest, of unrest of various kinds, um, I mean, we should do our best to promote God and His kingdom and His glory and His word and His teachings in our world. But don't get overwhelmed with that because God's on the throne. He's always been on the throne. He was on the throne four years ago. He's on the throne now. He'll always be on the throne. Focus on that. How does that then affect us? And that's kind of the relationship of this. And uh, this is not unique with me, and it, it seems you know, pretty self-evident in the text. So we have a revelation of a holy God. That leads then to sanctification of Isaiah, and then that leads to mission or dedication. So he sees a holy God. He realizes, well, how do I stand for a holy God? I'm unclean. God cleanses him, and now he has a mission. Now he has work to do. Now he has uh, his dedication to God. So look there at verse 1. God's alive. He's on the throne. He, he's authoritative. Since he's on the throne, all is well. He's exalted. I saw him high and lifted up. He's holy, as we see later on, and his, um, his, his train, his, his um, robe fills the temple. It filled the temple. Um, this has been illustrated to me. If you imagine you go to a wedding and you see the bride comes in, you know, the what, whatever that's called, the, <laughs> the part of the wedding dress you know that trails behind and the bride you're sitting there and you're waiting the bride comes in and just fills the whole building with that Isaiah says I see God and his robe fills the whole temple it's, it's emphasizing illustrating God's greatness and his holiness and he's served by all these angelic uh, beings these uh, seraphim uh, related to fire I guess and so it's it's a really dramatic scene and they're flying around and they're calling to each other. I mean, just, and again, as I was studying this, I was thinking about this. Think how dramatic this is. You come in, there's smoke, you hear these voices, and it's the most beautiful voices you've ever heard. Angelic choir, choirs answering each other, calling to one another, it says in verse 3. And they're singing in perfect harmony. You hear this, this perfect harmony of this, these choirs. Smoke's filling the whole place. And then in verse 4, the, the foundation or the post of the door is shaken. It's moved. Almost like an earthquake. Think of how that would impress you. And Isaiah sees that. And so they're calling out one to another, holy, holy, holy. He's the other. He's the complete other. And, and he is the Lord of hosts. I don't know how your Bible might translate that in verse 3. And, and we've talked about this a good bit before recently. You remember in James 5 when the uh, poor are mowing the fields of the rich and the rich are not paying them? And James says that the cries of the laborers has reached the, the Lord of S-A-B-A-O-T-H. Sabaoth. Sometimes we might look at that and say, well, that's a misprint. That's the Lord of Sabbath. No, it's the Lord of Sabaoth. Sabaoth, <clears throat> and at least I think that's in the King James it has that. Um, Sabaoth means uh, armies. Sava, Sava is an army and Sabaoth, armies. He's the commander of the armies. The Lord of hosts. Over 300 times the prophets use that phrase to describe God. And so the, he's the Lord of hosts that Isaiah sees. And the whole earth is full of his glory, <clears throat> of his heaviness, of his, of, of his weight. Do we see that? 
Now, Isaiah sees a special, unique picture, and I'm sure we haven't seen such a picture as that. So how does this apply to us? Do we seek to try to see a picture like Isaiah saw? No, I don't, I don't think so. But Isaiah saw this, and this affects Isaiah, and so as we read this, we're seeing this through Isaiah's eyes. And we should know, and it should be emphasized to us, that God is a God of holiness. And so that's the revelation. How does that affect us then? How do you react when you see a God of holiness? When you see God in His holiness? Look at verse 5. Isaiah says, Woe is me. He looks at himself honestly and he sees, I can't stand before a holy God. I am a man of unclean lips. Now, he's written some, some pretty uh, uh, bad things about the nation in chapters 1 through 5. You remember that? It's, it's like a person and they have sores from the top of their head, open sores, top of the he head to the soles of their feet. And they're walking around and he says they're just un undone, unclean. Isaiah now realizes, I am unclean. I'm a man of unclean lips. Why does he show his lips? I mean, is it not his, the rest of him unclean? Because the lips and our words show our hearts. I'm a un man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the middle of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king. You don't see God in, in the Hebrew Scriptures and live. And I've seen the king. He's probably thinking I must die at this point. He's the Lord of hosts again there. And yet he sees him and he will live. So the response to a holy God is to see ourselves honestly as sinners before him. If you have your Bibles, go over to the New Testament. I want to show you what I think is a New Testament counterpart to this. In the Gospel of Luke, <clears throat> Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, <clears throat> Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon. And that's, as you know, Simon Peter. And he asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. So he preaches a sermon and that's he's preaching from the boat. The people are on the banks there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon, or Peter, was a professional fisherman. And he answers, verse 5, Master... And he's answering, I think, with some respect, but he's basically saying, I, you know, this is not something you know anything about. We do. I'm a professional fisherman. We've worked hard all night, and we haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. It, to me, it, it's almost like he's saying, we're not going to catch anything, but, you know, so you'll be quiet about this. We'll just go out and put the nets down. I don't, there's no way we're going to catch anything. Verse 6, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came, filled both boats so full that they began to sink. And Peter's probably, it's almost like dollar signs in his eyes at this point, maybe, with all these fish from the sea. And so they're it, uh, splashing around, and he's fished all night, you know, and We'll put out anyway, but now it's, the boats are and they call, they call him. Hey, come over here and help us and all this. And then verse 8, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. I think that's counterpart to Isaiah's vision. When he saw all this, what kind of man is this? What kind of person is this? Go away from me. I'm a sinful man. 
For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And then Jesus answered and he said, don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. And that's the counterpart, I think, to Isaiah's commission. And so they pulled the boats in, they left everything and followed him. Let's go back now to Isaiah chapter five, or, yeah, Isaiah 6. <clears throat> so the revelation of God and His holiness, the cleansing from God. Isaiah says, I'm undone, I'm unclean. And, and by the way, in the Hebrew there, the eyes are emphatic. He's saying, I'm, I, I realize I'm in this situation. God then cleanses his lips. And in verse 6, his sin is taken away, his sin is covered. Sanctification. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? So he's seen God in his holiness. He's been cleansed. And Isaiah says, Here am I. Send me. Uh, Chris and I are leading a discussion on Monday nights through um, through Torah, through Genesis, and uh, last this last week, I think it's this last week, chapter twenty-two of Genesis, and uh, there Abraham there answers God and he says, "Here I am, here here I am." That's the same word that's used here. That's a significant word. It means to be fully present. It, it, means, it means more than to be physically present. The teacher calls the role and the student says here, present, present. It, it's more than that. It means to be fully, it means to be at your service. I'm here. I'm, I'm attentive to whatever you say. That's what Isaiah says. Then I said, here I am. I'm here. I'm attentive. And he says, send me. Now God's going to send him. And here's the, the message. It's a dismal message. He says, you go and tell these people. Have you really seen, but you won't see? You, you've heard, really heard, but you, you won't hear. And so make their ears heavy. Shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understanding in return and be healed. God basically says it's a message of judgment. Now what is this? Doesn't God want everybody to be saved? Why is he saying, seeing you won't see, hearing you won't, won't, won't hear? <clears throat> I think it's irony. We don't have time to go, but when Jesus is asked why he uses parables, he quotes this passage in, in Matthew 13 uh, and Mark 4. And He's not saying, I'm using parables so that they won't see. He's saying, I'm using parables, and the result is they don't see. That's the same thing here. God says, they see, but they won't see. They brought this upon themselves. And there may be also the idea, too, of a hardening of the heart that, I mean, you go so far, and God says, that's it. Now, Isaiah says, how long? How long? It's a lament. How long will this go on? And he says, until everything is destroyed, the cities are laid waste. And then as we said in verse 13, <clears throat> there is a remnant, a small part. And, and the doctrine of the remnants is pretty important in Isaiah. You read about it in um, various places, and we'll get to that when we, when we get there. We're going to, to sing a song <clears throat> of encouragement but I want us to see God in His holiness and see ourselves honestly before Him and then to realize He can use you. He can use me. And can we say with Isaiah, here am I, send me. Now understand, we're not Isaiah. And you're, you're not Isaiah. And, so we, and we have to be careful with texts like this. Maybe to you know, people think, well, I haven't seen a vision like Isaiah, and I want to see one. That's not the point of this text. <clears throat> but the point is to show a holy God, and a holy God calls us, and as we stand before Him, if not by His grace, if not for His mercy, we couldn't stand before Him. As Isaiah is going to talk about a child, Emmanuel, he's going to talk about the root. Of, of David. He's going to talk about in Isaiah 53 how that he died for our sins. If it were not for God's love in sending his son, we can't stand before him. 
And yet when he calls us, we have now, in a, in a sense, a commission. We, we have a mission to go out into the world and to show this holy God. And we do that by the way that we live. So we sing this song, if you are not a Christian, we call you to respond this morning to the good news of the gospel by repenting, it's turning away from sin, confessing the name of Jesus and being immersed. That's putting faith in Christ as your Savior. If you've done that, you wandered away, you need to see a picture of a holy God. You need to come back to Him. He's loving. He will forgive. And it's our prayer, if you need to come, that you'll do that while we stand and while we sing.